David Goodhart, you created, let's say, the categories of somewheres and anywheres. How, how, what, what's making an anywhere and why is he called or she an anywhere? Okay, well, I, I've written a book about the, the emerging value divides in, in Western societies and one of the main ones that I have uh, described is between the people who tend to be better educated and more mobile, generally speaking more liberally minded in, in politics, who I call the anywheres, uh, partly because they can fit in anywhere. Uh, and this is perhaps particularly relevant to Britain, although I think it does apply elsewhere too, because of our residential university system. So most of our educated class, most of the people, the, the smart people who run everything in Britain have left their hometown, have left their networks that they developed at school and through their families, and they've gone somewhere else at the age of 18 usually. Uh, then if they're, they're, they're pursuing more or less successful professional careers, they will often go to London, they may work abroad for a year or two, and that, that uh, gives them a certain, usually a certain set of values that, that relate to openness, they're, they're, they're comfortable with social fluidity, uh, they can they can ride social change easily. They tend not to have strong group attachments. And to somewheres? The somewheres, on the other hand, um, who are probably about half the population. Anywheres are, are not just metropolitan elites. Anywheres now are 20, 25 percent of the population, partly thanks to the rapid expansion of higher education. Uh, but the somewheres are um, are a kind of mirror image in, in in many ways of the anywheres. They tend to remain much more rooted. Nearly 60-65% of the British population still tends to live within, within 15, 20 miles of where they lived when they were 14 years old. We're a more rooted society than we think, even though we are becoming more mobile. But the somewheres are the, are the people that have remained rooted, tend to be less well educated, tend to value security and familiarity. Uh, they, they're not necessarily uh, strongly conservative, but they tend to value tradition more. Partly because they tend to, a large part of their identity is connected still to groups of various kinds. They have group attachments, bigger collective attachments to the nation state or to, 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 to their locality, their town, as it were, people like them. Uh, they feel that more strongly than anywheres. Um, and partly for that reason, they find social change, large scale immigration um, more discomforting. And they're making much more noise about it than they're used to, let's say, before the introduction of social media, of the internet. Is there, is there a process of, of, let's say, emancipation ongoing at the moment? So the somewheres are emancipating themselves from, from the anywheres? Yes, I think uh, that's quite a good way of putting it. I mean, there is a, what they, I mean, you might say there's a reaction, a revolt against anywhere domination. Anywhere domination on the scale of today is a quite recent phenomenon of the last generation, the last 20 or 30 years, I would say. Go back 30 or 40 years and somewhere priorities were still dominant in, in our societies in some ways, but that has completely changed. Much more, much more kind of liberal version of modernity has become uh, the, the dominant political story. Um, and the, the anywhere classes who dominate politics, dominate business, dominate the culture, um, have uh, often run things very much in their own interest, uh, whether it's European integration, mass immigration, um, the taking out of the democratic contest more and more things, you know, independent uh, central banks, the judicial activism, you know, all of these things tend to favour the anywhere worldview. And, and somewheres, uh, you know, one of the, a lot of somewheres stopped voting. About three million people voted in the Brexit referendum, for example, uh, who had not voted in the preceding four or five general elections. So meaning the silent majority that, is not silent anymore? Well, that feeling that there's no point voting because whether you vote yeah. you know, a Liberal Conservative Party or the Labour Party, they're all, they're all anywheres and on many, particularly the cultural issues that matter so much often to somewheres, uh, on those cultural issues particularly, there, there is complete consensus in the anywhere class, in the political class. So um, this was an opportunity, the Brexit vote um, was an opportunity to hit back against that liberal um, 
over domination of the agenda by the liberal anyways. And I think the, the social media have certainly played a role in that. Um, both, I think there's a sort of, there's a good side to it, which is that it's you know, people who, uh, I mean, you know, elites of various kinds had a kind of lock hold on access to the public space until quite recently, you know, access to, the, to traditional media, writing articles in newspapers, the BBC, radio, television, they were very tightly controlled. Um, and now, you know, all of those locks have been blown away and, you know, and people speak and a lot of the time it's rather ugly. Um, you know, the people, you know, you, and you do get, uh, I mean, the, the number of people in Britain who have genuinely xenophobic and racist views is quite small, anything between kind of three and, and six or seven percent, perhaps. And still, the universe, uh, uh, I think at least, that's my impression, I have this, have this feeling that now all the, the reactionaries, yeah. all the right-wingers are just breaking through. We, we exactly. We, look, it, it, you know, not long ago, um, there would have been a couple of people who, you know, who, who have what probably most of us, both anyways and somewheres, would consider objectionable views about minorities or about women or whatever. But they would just be a couple of blokes sitting at the bar you know, in, in a pub, um, and they wouldn't have had a voice. Now, even though they're quite a small number, um, they, you know, they have, um, they say outrageous things on Twitter or on Facebook or whatever, and their, 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 their voice is magnified. They've been given a megaphone. Um, it doesn't mean to say they, and I think this is, you know, anywheres often, liberal-minded people often, um, you know, see the masses always teetering on the edge of, of, of authoritarianism, you know, a, a new holocaust is just around the corner. There's a great mistrust, I think, of, of, of the silent majority, of the public, of the, you know, of the kind of, the, the less well-educated somewhere public uh, on the part of um, educated elites. In your book, there is something you call decent populism. Yeah, well, that's exactly my point. I think, and I, you know, I've, I've looked at all the, I've invented these two categories anywhere and somewhere, these labels, but, but, uh, but they, these worldviews genuinely are there in the data, in the things like the British Social Attitude Surveys. Also what is there in the d data, which I, think, um, which I think challenges the anywhere pessimism about the basic decency of the majority of somewheres, which is that they've essentially gone along with the great liberal changes, the great liberalisation, one might, one might call it, of the last 30 or 40 years, particularly in the cultural sphere, you know, attitudes to, on race, on gender and family, on, on sexuality. There's been huge, huge liberalisation. I mean, there is some resistance still, you know, 10, 15 percent of people, uh, you know, would, you know, are still hostile to homosexuality, for example, uh, or perhaps even a bit more. But, you know, these are, these are, um, these are relatively uh, unrepresentative views now, generally held by older people who are di dying out anyway. But most somewheres uh, are, you know, go have gone along with the great liberalisation, which doesn't mean to say that they are liberals. You know, they still have much stronger attachment to national identity than most conventional liberals. They're still hostile to mass immigration. They still worry about the dilution of, of cohesive social norms. They worry about minorities not being integrated properly. They put security before liberty. They have a strong um, belief in and desire for order. You know, they are somewhat more authoritarian than uh, the more usually more individualistic liberal anywheres. Do you think there is any chance of, of reconciliation between somewheres and anywheres? And if yes, what would be the best way to, 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 to you know, provide a possibility for reconciliation? Yeah, I mean, this is absolutely the primary task of politics, it seems to me, in Western societies now, is, you know, and this is what we should all be bending our thoughts towards, is how do we find the common ground? How do we find new settlements? I mean, the, and, and I think, you know, one can, you know, looking, looking, looking back, I think one can find periods in the past when, uh, you know, I mean, politics is, after all, all about dealing with resolving uh, conflicts of interest. They, they've now found a voice, they've now reasserted their power through Brexit, through the Trump election, through the, you know, the success of populist parties in Europe. The, you know, these have given somewheres voice and confidence to, to, to push back against anywhere dominance and, to, you know, and, and out of this we can try and find a new settlement. We need to find common ground 
uh, you know, common enemies provides that. It's, 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 it's maybe difficult to find common enemies, but we can find common purposes. I mean, through the environment, for example. I mean, a, a lot of somewhere is very rooted people. They, you know, they're, 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 they want to preserve the places that they came from. Uh, a lot of anywheres have a kind of more abstract sort of green environmentalism. Uh, you know, you, might, you can sort of see the combination in an odd way in, say, an, you know, anti-fracking demonstrations where, you know, the, the local people will be sort of coming out to say, no, we don't want the fracking in our area because it's going to ruin our, our locality. And you get, all the, the, you get the kind of green, anywhere, educated people from the universities coming in to, to support them. Um, and I, I think there are other areas like that, I think, where we can see... Uh, the you know the foundation of of a, of a common politics again. Of course, there will still be conflicts of interest, but in the same way that you know we created a coalition, we created uh, you know a compromise between the social classes after the Second World War in most European societies. You had the kind of compromise, uh, the creation of the welfare states, taxation of of richer people increased. Um, and I think you know we, we need to find some something comparable in this in this new value conflict. Uh, that, that have emerged. Common ground. Yeah. Indeed. David Goodhart, many thanks for your time, many thanks for this little chat. Thank you so much. <laughs>